Larson, who's going to come up and uh, tell you about his new book, which is freaking awesome. So I'll leave you to it. Let me just tell you a couple little anecdotes off the top of my head from the history that you might might not have known. Did you know that you could buy pre-rolled joints at pharmacies in Canada for about 70 years, from 1850 till about 1930? And that people were buying pre-rolled joints for medicine. They were getting tinctures and, and all these different cannabis extracts were available. But the very first person in Canada to get charged for possession of marijuana was a guy in Vancouver who was charged for possession of joints. And he said he bought them at a pharmacy for his hay fever. And the judge said, no, no, that's, that's a dangerous narcotic drug and gave him 18 months of hard labor. And that was the first guy. But uh, so people aren't aware of that. And, did, and here's another fact for you. Did you know that... During most of that time, from about 1850 to the early 1900s, they were getting dogs high in very large quantities because they didn't really know how marijuana worked back then, right? So they knew it got people high and had all these wonderful effects, but they weren't sure if it was the resin or the oil or what was going on. So they'd make these tinctures and, and extracts, and they have wildly varying potencies. So Park Davis and Canadian uh, medical journals and newspapers advertised that their products were superior because there was no chemical test, but they used a biological test, which would mean they had hundreds of dogs, and people's job would be to give these dogs a dose of marijuana tincture, and then keep notes of how long till the dog passes out, how long till its front legs buckle, and, and this kind of thing, and they would use this method to gauge the potency of their marijuana. So, and I'm, you know, animal testing's not a great gig, but if you have to be one of the animals getting tested on, probably the dog that gets as high as fuck every day has got to be one of the better jobs in the animal testing lab. But, uh, yeah, so there's a couple of fun stories. And, like, uh, earlier on in Canada, in the 16 and 1700s, uh, the British and French both were trying to grow as much hemp as possible as they could in Canada uh, because they really needed it for their navies to keep all their boats going. They needed it for their ropes and their sails. And Canadian farmers didn't really want to grow cannabis because it was a lot of work and it was very difficult to do and took a lot of manual labor. So they would bribe them and push the prices up and try to do it. But... It's the exact opposite of now, where we really want to grow a lot of cannabis, and the government won't let us, but for the first 200 years of Canadian history, it was the exact opposite, with the federal government bribing farmers to grow more cannabis so they could keep their boats going. And, uh, and you know, so it's, it's a really fascinating story. There's lots of cool things. Here's a fun one for you. Canada's first recorded hashish overdose was this guy uh, in the 1850s. And there's a medical journal about it and an uh, article about it. He said, it's so, because it was so rare... They wanted to record this case of this hashish overdose. And we all know this guy. He was like, I've tried this a few times, and I never got high. It doesn't work on me. It's, it has no effect. And his doctor was like, well, try this. And he gave him several grains of very strong uh, cannabis to ingest. And the guy had got super high and started freaking out and had, like, a panic attack. And, and uh, he, parts of it, he said, were ecstatic. And he was floating around and having all these hallucinations. But uh, they wrote about this in Canadian medical journals in the 1850s, and people were doing this kind of stuff quite a bit, getting high for fun as well as for medicine, just like we do now. You know, they think it's a new thing, and oh, this is all a new thing, but Canadians and people have been getting high and smoking joints and doing this stuff for all of our country's history. In the late 1800s and 1898, the head of the Nova Scotia Medical Association wrote in their journal about using marijuana for sexual enhancement, how it made sex more fun and made it last longer, and how about people were taking medicine, cannabis medicines and hallucinating and having fun times. And it was a really popular thing back then. And all this got erased during the 1930s and 40s, where they destroyed a lot of this information. And you can see in the newspapers how the tone changes and how they turn against this dangerous drug marijuana and the immigrants and dark-skinned people that are using it to seduce our white woman and to ruin the white race and they want to get us all hooked on the dope so they can take over and this was a very dominant theme there was novels and books written and in the mclean's magazine articles about this and it was a real fear a lot of people have that the darkies and the chinese the yellow horde were all going to take over and ruin all the white people with their drugs and that's largely why they banned it in canada and around the world and so that ignorance and that bigotry is still around today, but we are making a lot of change. And the last part of my book really chronicles a lot of the modern activists and people that have helped change these laws over the last 20 years and get us where we are today, where we can enjoy what really feels like legalization right here in this room right now, and for many of us is. But, you know, people are still getting busted for selling bogs in Canada. Just drive four hours north of where we are right now, and there's stores a few months ago that got busted and charged. This guy's facing charges for promoting and selling bongs and pipes in Canada 
just four hours away while we're here, you know, buying and selling and enjoying marijuana and all these kind of things. It's bizarre how uh, how the laws are just a patchwork across this country. And you go, you know, another few hours north and you get to places in the, the far north where marijuana is like $50, $100 a gram and where it's very inaccessible and people get charged with possession and trafficking and vast, vast quantities, far higher levels than we do down here. And, uh, and that stuff's in my book too. It goes out to modern times. So I'm not going to talk too much more, but those are all the kind of things you'll find if you... To grab a copy of my book and, and to know that when you're smoking cannabis and enjoying that now that you're partaking in a tradition that, that's been part of human history really for thousands of years, long before there was a Canada. People have been smoking and growing and using cannabis and making things out of it. And it's something, you know, for me, I've been in this cause for over 20 years and it's been a constant uh, mind-blowing experience to find out all the wonderful things this plant can do. I mean, even if pot just got us high and made us feel warm inside and it had no medical benefits and you couldn't eat the seeds and you couldn't do... That would still be awesome. Like, just getting stoned is great. But the fact that the same plant also can heal us, can, can take away our pain, can make clothes that we can wear, can make seeds that we can eat, can have all these wonderful benefits in so many different ways from the same one plant, it's, it's really so remarkable. And I keep finding out new ways that cannabis can help us and heal us and new things that it can do. And so for me, it's been a never-ending voyage and, and opening dispensaries and seeing the, the people whose lives are changed by this in so many positive ways. And, and, uh, and you know, it's, it's been a hard haul, but right now we're on the verge of such massive change across Canada with dispensaries like Canawide and so many others opening uh, all across the country. And this is going to continue. And it... And it takes bravery and, and courage, you know. I mean, in Nanaimo, they just raided three dispensaries a couple of days ago. They all reopened the next day, which I think is remarkable and very important. And uh, and in Halifax, they also just raided a dispensary, which had been raided a year ago. And they'd reopened then, and now they've just gotten raided again. And I'm pretty sure they're going to reopen if they can and keep going. And, uh, and you know, this reminds me of the 1990s when the same thing was happening with bong shops, where they were getting raided and, and getting shut down. People were going to jail for the weekend for selling bongs, getting their inventory seized. But we were opening more head shops and more bong shops, and they could raid, and the police just kind of gave up. Although, like I said, they still pick them off in small towns then and then. And now the same thing is happening with the herb itself, with dispensaries. And we're starting with medical cannabis, but we know that's just to get our foot in the door, because all use is medical, and if cannabis makes you feel good and helps you relax, that's good medicine, right? We all know that. So that's the next step in our, in our overgrowing the government. And we're not waiting for Trudeau to make it happen for us. We're so glad he's in there and he's going to legalize it. We were opening these places under Harper under very severe penalties. And now we've got a government that's going to legalize. So we've got to open more dispensaries than ever before. We've got to push forward harder. We've got to get out there and overgrow the government more than we ever have and make sure that we have legalization. It's, it's the kind of legalization that we want. You know, people. some people want to legalize it, meaning it's still going to be exactly the same as it is now, but I'm going to be the dealer who sells y'all weed for 10 bucks a gram, right? And there's only going to be a few of them. That's not legalization. Legalization means you can grow it. Legalization means you can sell it. It means that the price is way lower than it is now. That's what legalization really means, right? It means it's free for people to do, that it's legal, that no one's going to jail. And that's what we're fighting for. That's what I'm fighting for. And uh, hey, it's been a great night, and I've had a lot of fun. And I'm at Canna White all day tomorrow, so if you got any friends who want any books, I'll be down there signing those as well. And i got the fun book, The Green Buds and Hash, as well, my Dr. Seuss parody. And uh, that's got a little marijuana message. I don't know if I'm talking too long, but I'm going to say something about that Green Buds and Hash book. Because I wrote that book as kind of a joke and a funny thing that I thought was just kind of cute. But so many people, and I didn't really even think about it for kids. I thought of it for grown-ups. But so many people are telling me they're reading it to their kids. Their kids sometimes are medical marijuana users who are children who need it for their epilepsy and other treatment, or their parents use it, and they don't really know how to talk about it with their kids, and they read them my book, and it helps bridge that gap. And it's like something I, in retrospect, it seems obvious, but it didn't really even occur to me. And it's actually been quite moving. Some of these kids have sent me drawings of the characters, and you know, it's my daddy's medicine and stuff, and it blows my mind, like, how that, that reaction is. And uh, so, yeah, so there you go. And uh, I think I'm done talking, but if you want to chat more, come over to the table. I'm not going to be here until 3 a.m., but uh, I'll be here a while. But okay. thanks very much, and thanks to Canada. Thank you, Dana. Dana Larson, you're awesome.